Welcome to today's webcast. Uh, it's kind of a thorny topic, evicting friends or family members, which is something we would hope none of us would ever have to face because our family relationships are fun fundamental and so important in our lives, but sometimes it's necessary. I understand today that some of you may have questions about what do I do with a family member who's residing in my home and that, that needs to be uh, removed or needs to leave. Um, an important place to start with something like this is always at the beginning. And in Arizona, the primary uh, authority for you would be the Arizona Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. A uh, simple Google search will take you to uh, the Arizona Residential Landlord and Tenant Act. And fortunately, that is a comprehensive pamphlet that's also posted on the website of the Arizona Department of Housing, as well as other useful resources. But when you're talking about uh, removing a family member or a friend from your home, you have to consider first uh, an important uh, criteria is the why. If you're in a situation where you're in a home uh, with uh, an individual that you're related to by blood or marriage or a friend, and the relationship has become challenging, harassing, violent, if you're a victim of abuse, harassment, intimidation, bullying, um, perhaps then eviction is not the, the first or, or best place for you to start. Uh, the courts have the opportunity for you, if you are at the receiving end of this kind of unfortunate behavior, you can get an emergency order through the equity powers of the court called an order of protection. These are orders that are issued by the courts uh, in connection with people who may be in a family relationship by blood or marriage, or if you're cohabitating together uh, and you're in an intimate relationship, if you're not related by blood or marriage, or if you're not in an intimate relationship, you would get a sister type of or order, which is issued by the same powers, and it's called an injunction prohibiting harassment. Uh, these types of orders are issued by any of the municipal courts, justice courts, or superior courts. Uh, the forms are available at the courthouse. There is no filing fee. You simply need to answer the questions, and then you'll be able to see the judge handling those matters that day. Um, when you go before the judge, he or she will ascertain the allegations in your complaint to determine whether or not what you have claimed satisfy the statutory requirements to get this kind of emergency help from the court. If the court issues that kind of an order, then law enforcement through the courts would serve this on the person against whom they are directed. When that happens, often the order would require the person who's causing you uh, the grief or the, the, the problem to be removed from the property. Now, this is perhaps just a temporary um, relief because when a person is served with this kind of an order, whether it's an order of protection or an injunction, they've received an order that's based upon a one-sided conversation with the court. And so, of course, they have the opportunity to tell the court their side of the story if they should desire. So uh, the recipient of, of an injunction or a protective order can go and request a hearing. The court's required to have one in 10 days. And in that case, both parties will be uh, required to appear before the court. And when the court concludes with that hearing, after taking the testimony and evidence, they can either um, tighten the control if they feel that's warranted, or they could expand uh, the parameters on what the other person is allowed to do, or they may dismiss it entirely. With these kinds of orders, it's not uncommon for the court to order a person off of a property or to not have contact by phone, in person, by email, or even through third parties unless it's an attorney or the court. So again, circling back, if you're if the starting point of your consideration of removing a family member or friend from your dwelling unit is because you're at the receiving end of abuse, harassment, intimidation, or bullying, you may consider getting not an eviction, but an order of protection or an injunction. Okay, now shifting gears, let's just suppose that you're in a situation where you are living with a family member or a friend and it's just time for them to move on. Let's say that you're a parent with an adult child who just won't uh, leave the nest, or perhaps you have a friend who came to stay for a while, but who just after months is not making any efforts to become independent or get out. What do you do? So the 
the solution is essentially the same, whether or not you have a written agreement. So ideally under the law, if you are the owner of a property or if you're a tenant with the opportunity to, to sublease, you would be considered a landlord. As a matter of fact, under the Arizona Residential Landlord Tenant Act, a landlord is defined as this. A landlord is the owner or lesser or a sub lesser of a dwelling unit or the building of a premises. And when we're talking about uh, premises here, we're talking about dwelling units, a place where a person sleeps, rests, or has their home. We're not talking about commercial properties or storage units. We're not talking about mobile home spaces. We're talking about the place in which you live. So if, for example, you're the owner of a property and your children have moved in and it's time for them to move on, you'd be the landlord, they would be the tenant. If you're a tenant and you have the authority to say sublease to roommates, then with regard to the roommates, you would be the landlord and they would be your tenant. Um, that would be the legal posture. So ideally, there's a written lease agreement that identifies the parties and the amount of rent that's due and owing and what kind of notice is required to resolve situations, who and where and how uh, notices are to be delivered and so on. But because people often uh, don't create contracts when they're dealing with close family members or friends, it's okay. You would have an implied contract. And in that case, the Landlord Tenant Act would fill in the gaps. So in the absence of a written rental agreement, there still is an implied contract and the Landlord Tenant Act would dictate the terms. So the first thing you need to know is that if you don't have a written lease agreement that requires someone to pay rent, the law states that in the absence of one, every tenant, every person who's there in the property, who's living there and has the right to dwell, say, in a room or in a house to the exclusion of all others, who is a tenant, has an obligation to pay fair market rent. So what is fair market rent? Well, <laughs> that's, a, that's a question with a couple of different ways to approach it. One, it has to be fair. And two, it has to represent your market. What, what is uh, fair market rent in Maricopa County may not even resemble what fair market rent is in Navajo County. Different markets vary. The type of property also makes an important consideration, but let's just make it simple. For example, if I was the owner of a property and I had let a friend move into, let's say, a home that I owned and it was supposed to be temporary, but it's just time for them to go, and they were supposed to have paid rent, but they never got around to it. I could, for example, go to Zillow.com, punch in the address, and it would tell me normally what fair market rent would be for that property. Sometimes it's surprising. With current market trends and the way that uh, real estate values went up recently, rents also increased dramatically. It's not uncommon for people to be renting properties uh, well below what the current market rent is for the location of the property. Anyways, it's one way to determine what the fair market rent is. If a person... Uh, doesn't have a lease agreement, they're required by law to give you fair market rent on the first day of the month. And it's not your responsibility to chase them down. It's their duty to find you as the landlord and give the rent to you. If, uh, if the person who's occupying your property, friends or family, or any tenant doesn't pay the rent, then you start the eviction process to evict for non-payment of rent, which starts with an eviction notice which if is not paid, follows with an eviction action, which in the case of non-payment, unless they pay, is likely to be uh, result in a judgment for non-payment of rent. Once judgment's entered, then as the owner of the property, the landlord, uh, you can reply for the constable after five calendar days. And it's impressive that most of the justice courts where the eviction actions occur, how quickly the, the constables can turn that responsibility around from receiving the the order to removing the tenant to, to, that's being evicted to actually doing it is very impressive. They do a, such a high volume of work and it, it, they do a great job at a bargain price. Um, another uh, reason why you might want to evict is because the situation is escalating. Now, sometimes if you don't have a written rental agreement, then you don't have any kind of uh, boundaries on who the person can have at the property or if they can have pets or not, or whether they can smoke inside the property and so on. If you wanna have those kinds of behavioral controls, you have to have a written contract. So for example, if you have a friend move into your house and then it was just supposed to be him or her, and then you found out that they invited half a dozen or more of their closest friends, 
without a written rental agreement, you can't stop the relationship based upon that. Or if they moved in a cat or a dozen dogs, that's why written uh, contracts are important. However, if a person who's your tenant engages in behavior which may be criminal in nature, you have the right to take action right away and get relief right away. In the Arizona Residential Landlord Tenant Act, let's suppose that you have a property and you may not be living there, but you're letting it to someone. And let's say that they engage in the illegal discharge of a weapon, which is the discharge of a firearm other than in self-defense, even in an accidental discharge. Um, what if they engage in prostitution, criminal street gang activity, um, an assault, uh, the use or possession, controlling manufacturing or, or, or possession of a controlled substance, anything other than marijuana? Um, what if they're hoarding or causing serious property damage? If a person is engaging in that kind of bad, uh, imminent serious property damage or criminal behavior, you don't have to give a notice in advance for them to stop. What the law says is that you may give them a notice, but the word was not shall. You may give them a notice of termination, but you have the right to file an immediate eviction action. Immediate eviction actions um, have the same origin as a regular eviction, but here's the, 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 the stark difference. If you bring an eviction action based upon bad behavior, such as imminent serious property damage or criminal behavior, and you get the judgment, you satisfy the judge, then you can have the constable come or you can request the constable the very next day. So in Maricopa County, like most counties, if I were to file an eviction action today, being Wednesday, I would normally have an eviction hearing within five business days, say uh, Tuesday or Thursday, Friday, perhaps of next week. And when I have the, the hearing and I get a judgment, that means that if I got a judgment a week from today, next Wednesday, I could apply for the constable the very next day, being Thursday. And from my experience, the constables can come out in 40, 24, 48, 72 hours from the entry of judgment, depending on their workload. So as far as legal actions go, eviction actions are very, very fast. They only take a matter of days. And because eviction actions are have such swift time frames, they're what we call special actions. They're governed by different laws and different rules procedure than other lawsuits, and they should not go on for days and weeks or months. But you should, if you're on your game, in a situation that does not affect health and safety or property damage, you can get a tenant out for non-payment of rent, for example, before a calendar month expires. Um, so we've talked about getting a person out for cause, uh, such as an order protection or an injunction. We've talked about an eviction for non-payment of rent, which is a common reason why landlord-tenant relationships come to an end. We've talked briefly about immediate eviction actions, which are very serious. But let's just suppose that it's just time, and they're paying their rent, and you are their month-to-month -month tenants. What do you do? Well, in Arizona, either a landlord or a tenant can give a notice of intent to terminate the month-to-month -month tenancy. And it can be for any reason. You don't have to give an explanation. Um, you just need to give a 30-day notice. It's important to know that in our state, unless you have a written contract that says otherwise, notice needs to be in writing, a hard piece of paper, and it needs to be hand-delivered to the person or sent by certified mail. And when the law talks about hand delivery, that means putting the notice in their hand, delivering it to them like you would a pizza, delivering it, not taping it to a door, putting it under the, the rug, emailing it to them under the windshield wiper, giving it to the neighbor. No, it means giving it to them. However, I think the best practice is what the law also permits you to do, which is giving a notice by certified mail. And when a landlord or a tenant gives a notice by certified mail, the law, the courts are required to conclude that the recipient got it after five calendar days, whether they actually picked it up or not, or whether they actually received it or not, and that they also are presumed to have notice of the contents of that notice. So I prefer, and I think it's the best practice to always send notices by certified mail if you can. That way it removes any argument from the table as to whether or not the person personally received a notice.
the courts won't even argue. They'll just look at your proof of certified mail and count the days. When you're giving a 30-day notice, it's important to know and understand this. Our law looks at each month as, as its own insular period, per, period of time. Think of it like a block. So, so from the 1st to 31st, that is one insular block of time. And the law says that the notice needs to come 30 days before the first day of the month in which the, note, the, the lease will come to an end. For example, if I wanted a tenant to get out by the end of the year, they would need to have received a 30-day notice by or before the first day of December because that is 30 days before the first day of January. If they got the notice on the first or presumed delivery by the first, because I sent it earlier by certified mail, then their lease would be up at the end of the month. In our in Arizona, if you send a notice on the 15th, it does not end their lease on the 15th of the following month. Remember, the law looks at each month as a block and that cannot be subdivided. So what you want to do is just make sure your notices go early so that it ends when you want it to. If a tenant doesn't vacate at the end of the month when their lease terminates, then you bring an eviction action. And again, it's going to take three and a half to four weeks from the start of the eviction action to the constable to remove from the property if they don't go voluntarily. This has been an AZ Court Help Legal Talk on evicting a friend or relative. Thank you.